Good evening and welcome to another episode of A Politically Incorrect Guyana. My name is Kian Jabur and as usual, I am your host this evening. Well, not too usual, actually. Um, uh, I know I wasn't here last week, my apologies. Um, we did have a wonderful team from ANUG here that um, was able to really, uh, you know, give us a little bit of insight on this Asha Kisun um, and the joiner seat debacle we are in currently. So it's definitely a topic of conversation we're going to be continuing. But before that, I just again like to thank Mr. Naya Stanton for hosting. Um, and then again, Mr. Timothy Jonas, Jonas for joining me this evening. Um, you'll see him in a second. <laughs> He's here. <laughs> I'm not by myself. Um, but nonetheless, um, uh, it's been an interesting uh it's been an interesting two weeks or so for the third parties here in Guyana. And I think that may be the topic of conversation we're going to be surrounding this evening. Um, what I think is on the mind of all those fence sitters out there. We what I like to also what I like to first state is I think everybody needs to always remember that Guyana, since it's um since its, its, its founding fathers uh, got our independence, has always been a two-party state. And as we all know, historically, it's been um, two race-based parties, being the afro guyanese centric and the indo guyanese centric It's just how it turned out in this country, and it's been perpetuated by these the PNC and the PVP throughout history as ensuring that the people stay divided. Um, part of that... Uh, strategy is also ensuring that the people are not well educated or exposed. And because of this, we always have to remember that either the people that don't understand why third parties are necessary, or the people that are greatly benefiting from the two party system will always ensure that they try to maintain the two party system. All right, because one is very scared of the other side going in because they don't know any better. And then the other one gets all the riches and is the friends and family and makes all the money. And they wanted to stay a two party system as well. And what we have to remember is that is always going to be majority of this country, at least in the near future. Because of this, you have to remember that it is a very small group of people that sit on the fence. That group of people is only in and around 20 to 30,000 people. All right. What you find is even a large percentage of that 20 or 30,000 people still often bounce back and forth between PNC and PPP, depending on who they feel is better. Um, but then there is that small group that I like to call the enlightened because they realized that no matter how many times you bounce back between the PPP and the PNC, we're always going to end up in the same place. Um, I think we've had enough of a history lesson from everybody else as to why these two parties are identical. I think everybody can sit down themselves now and realize that there's no difference between the PPP and the PNC. One just paints a better picture at a certain time than the other. All right, now that the PPP are back in, we're seeing the people suffer the same way. We're seeing one group of people gain largely and, and benefit um, from all the, the perks of, of, of the money in the country. And then everybody else just kind of have to hope for the crumbs that fall by. We saw the same thing when the PNC was in there. We see the PPP be highly corrupt. We, see, we saw the PNC highly corrupt and we know we end up caught and this is something is a very good conversation for me what I also find is that people in this country um, what I'd like people to do what I always ask them to do is when they say oh um, the PVP is gonna win or the PNC is gonna win I always ask them you know how many people have you ever are in are within your circle that have voted for the opposite party that your main group of people support. So for example, those that say, oh, you know, everyone around me keeps talking about the PVP and how well they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. I always ask them, well, how many people that you hang around voted for the PNC ever? And they always look at me with this kind of baited, like, well, now that I think about it, none. <laughs> you know what I mean? And likewise, the PNC people who have a, a huge following, you know, you know, I, I, I learned it, I learned it, Every now and again, I get a shock value when you when you look at Gordon Mosley's posts. 
or you look at you know one day i posted something about rice uh, rice rice flour in the country and the pnc picked it up and it had hundreds of people share thousands of comments and i went wow both of these organizations organizations are so vibrant and their people are so active but none really know that the other side exists because there's no mixing and matching so why I, why I bring this up now is because, as I said, there is that small group of people in the middle that, can, that, that understand that these two parties are identical. And they ensure that uh, the majority of the population stays split so that they can peddle their propaganda to their people on either sides. Now, what I always want to remind people is that at the end of the day, these two parties are so closely, um, so closely uh, aligned when it comes to statistics, when it comes to percentage of the population, when it comes to their voter bases. They're so closely aligned at every election you see it that the government of this country, at least, and let's even not talk about the far past, over the last 15 to 20 years, the last three election cycles, the, major the, the, the government of this country was not decided by the majority of the population and the electorate. It was decided by less than 10,000 people. A little more than 10,000. Right. That's about that number. That's okay. Well, for the last two elections, correct me if I'm wrong, the last two elections is only one seat. One seat, which is about 5,000. Which is about 5,000 people. So about 5,000 people determine who the government of this country is because the pvp people can vote for the pvp and they can run on the comments here and you know on on, on every platform you see different followers you're not gonna find plenty of pnc followers on this platform they're gonna go on and on and on. you're gonna say oh my gosh look how many people and then on the other flip side you're gonna see the pvp people doing the same thing oh we're winning look at all the comments it's all pnc comments and i laugh every time because it's only that five thousand people in the middle that aren't talking <laughs> those are the five thousand people that actually determine who the government of the country is all right and what i'd like to point out as well is that the last so and this is always something i, I enjoy pointing out in 2015 when everybody hated the ppp the PVP are so corrupt. The PVP is only friends and family. The PVP only give, only, only are helping themselves and they, they've gone above everybody and they don't care about anybody else and, and et cetera, et cetera, and all the bad things they said. Everybody that, that came out in their masses to support the APNU AFC in 2015, the APNU AFC still only won by one single seat. And then fast forward quickly, no confidence motion in 2020 elections. Everybody was like, the APNU AFC is, has, has, has run this country into the ground. We have no money. It's horrible. We have to change our government. And everybody in all the media houses were against them, except for the few that were aligned. And everybody was like, yes, the PPP are going to win. And they all came out in their numbers. Tim, correct me if I'm wrong. How many seats are the, is the PPP in government by right now? That's it. You're, you're right. It's still just that one seat. And one seat. I think there's there's a bit more to be said about it. You see, you you see people sitting on the fence. I don't call them sitting on the fence. When I look at our society, I think that we should win world awards for how well our different races and our different religions cohabit, coexist, and get along with each other and rub shoulders. Um, I haven't seen anywhere else where people who look different, dress different, behave different. Pray different. Pray different, get mm -hmm. along so well. Mm -hmm. It just is not a problem by and large. Um, now, that goes from the bottom all the way to the top. And I want to say this, that if you look at the individuals in the PPP and you look at the individuals in the PNC, there are good people in there, there are competent people in there, there are also racists in there and incompetent people in there. They do not look any different from the general demographic of Guyana. We say that Guyanese vote race and it took me a little while to realize that that is not true. You see, <laughs> when you say Guyanese vote race, it sounds like a negative. It sounds as if you are condemning the Guyanese electorate because they select their candidates on the basis of racism. And I don't think that's the case. The folk who support the PPP, the thinking folk who support the PPP, don't do so 
because they are overwhelmed and overjoyed at how expertly the PPP is transparently, unfairly, and honestly running the country. They do so because they perceive the PNC to be an institution that is ethnically aligned against them. Mm -hmm. And the people who support the PNC, APNU, are not overwhelmed and overjoyed with how expertly <laughs> the vision as Granger ran the place between 2015 and 2020. They support APNU because they see the PPP as an organization that is race-based and shows ethnic preference to its own. And therefore, they see a PPP government as marginalizing them. Mm -hmm. So Guyanese don't vote race. Guyanese vote against race. They vote against an institution <laughs> okay. that is race-based because they're right and common sense tells them that they're doing the right thing. If you're an Afro-Guyanese and you recognize that the Indocentric party shows preference to contractors, to gives contracts, gives employment to people of its own ethnicity, mm -hmm. common sense says you can't vote for them. And if you're Indo-Guyanese and you recognize that the Afrocentric party similarly will give contracts, employment, whatever honors and, and bonuses are there to people who look like them, by and large, it's kind of stupid to go and vote for that party. So we don't vote race, we vote against race. Interesting. <laughs> and when, when that penny dropped with me, I, I, I had to try to consider how do you then fight that? Mm -hmm. Because you can't condemn someone for doing what common sense tells you. It's almost self-defense. It's yeah. self-defense. Right. what hard experience tells him to do. Okay. So what you have to try to do is say to the minority that you're talking about, the people who recognize, first of all, that the party that looks like them is not doing a good job and has not done a good job. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that the party that doesn't look like them is not doing a good job, but it really is no worse than their own party. Mm -hmm. Really is, it is marginal how bad the two are. We are between the devil and the deep blue sea. Right. And if you form that realization, the only logical conclusion is you can't support either party anymore. Right. That's how it is. And interestingly enough, I'm seeing more and more, especially mixed couples, but people who when they're rubbing shoulders in society are interacting with people that don't look from them, look like them. And I've, I've spoken to mixed couples and I've seen it. If you got a family, you can discuss politics in the family because there's your people. You can't get vexed with your brother and your sister and your mother discussing politics. You might disagree. But at the end of the day, you know each other and that blood keeps you tied tomorrow after your disagreement is over. So the <laughs> politics in Guyana should be discussed in families. And more so because your family is the same race as you. So you can have a fair, honest discussion about the ethnicity of issue, about the race issue, about the corruption issue, and tomorrow you're still family. Mm -hmm. I have seen mixed couples where one side has historically, and their family, I promise you, has historically voted for one side, and the other member of that couple, their family, has historically voted for the other side. And they don't know what to do. Okay. <laughs> because they begin to recognize that there is truth in the argument that that ethnic party there supports its own. Mm -hmm. And therefore, my husband or my wife is going to be marginalized and excluded by that ethnic party. Right. What do you do? Yeah. So in families where these discussions are being had, you see very interesting discussions. And often you see like an epiphany that people realize <laughs> the only way to resolve this, especially in a winner-take-all system, where if it's only those two parties, the party with 51% gets the whole country and all the contracts and all the oil and all the money and all the corruption. And the fifth party with 49% gets nothing and is marginalized. The only way to solve this is to vote is to support neither party and to hope that a third party can remove that two horse system so that there is some measure of accountability. Hold on, we're taking an interesting conversation. <laughs> all right. First of all, I couldn't agree more, okay? But the conversation is about to take a very interesting turn here. Now, we have a situation on our hands um, that's been playing out in the media. Um, 
in which uh, historically has been something of a, of a trend when it comes to third parties here in Guyana. Um, I'm going to speak as the average man, and I'm going to ask you how we can logically look at this and address this. I'm, I'm, I'm actively going to tell you to, to promote and, and speak about what you want. But um, now, from AFC, is the first time in 2011 when a minority government was created. Um, I think they won about seven seats, which is a fantastic number because what it shows is that there's enough people out there that understand that a third party is necessary. AFC then joined APNU AFC. Now I'm going to say something a little contentious here because I'm, I, it was not everyone, and I think yourself included, but it was some of us because I myself was included in that mass group in which at the time the AFC joined APNU, None of us had an issue with it. All of us in our mind, all we said was, whatever it takes to get PPP out. I don't agree. No, no, oh, no, no. I'm speaking about the masses because at the end of the day, you got to look at the numbers that voted. Well, you right? say masses, but we've already agreed that 50% go one way, 50% go the other way. Right. So when you say masses, you really mean the, 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 the little 10,000, the, the, the AFC, the AFC group. So the people, that, hold on, but let me finish. The people that supported the third party, at least at that time, um, they obviously continued to support AFC, even though they had joined, which means although some people may have disagreed, the majority still agreed. We had to, we, we were joining forces with AP and UAFC, the rebranded PNC, and we are going forward to get rid of PPP. That was the idea. Vote like a boss, whatever it was back then, right? So they did that. And all of us jumped and we cheered, majority of us jumped and we cheered and we said, this is great, PPP finally gone. The first two years of AP and UAFC, we were saying, you know what? This ain't bad, man. We, you know, they're cleaning up the, 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 the cities. They're doing this. They build, a, a, <laughs> they build the best from about to date. <laughs> All right. The rest are garbage. Nonetheless, um, they, they, they cleaned up GRA. I, you know, I can, I can honestly tell you, in my opinion, right at this moment, they, crime was definitely lower then than it is now. Okay. Even, the, even though the country was destitute, according to everyone. Nonetheless, um, we, we, we fast forward to... 2018, 2019, 20, that was it. We realized this is garbage. AP and UAFC waste the time. We were highly upset, us again, third party voters, highly upset that that AFC joined the PVP APNU. Why would you do this? It was a betrayal. The PVP happily painted it as, look at this, they betrayed the third party voters. We could never trust another third party. Okay? Now, again, just again to remind you, we did it happily in, in 2015. We agreed with it. Granted, AP, AFC had um, fast forward, AFC did garbage. They, they, they didn't have a backbone. They didn't stand up for themselves. They didn't maintain their independence. They got consumed by the PNC, and that was the end of them. Okay? And now we then had um, the joiner list that has now come together. And the, you know, um, again, at least a fair percentage of the third party voters voted enough to get a seat in parliament for the joiner, right? So we all joined our votes together. Now, Lennox Schumann went in and came out. People have all their opinions about him. Oh, he didn't do enough. Um, he didn't maintain his independence enough. We could go on and on. At the end of the day, Lennox Schumann has removed himself rightfully, um, resigning from parliament. And people can continue to say what they want about what he didn't do. But the fact of the matter is he's not a content contending player anymore. Right? Nor did he do any harm, is what we can argue. All right? And now we have a current situation in which we have uh, Ms. Asha Kisun, Dr. Asha Kisun in parliament, and she's refusing to resign on her own will. All right, even though the agreement had stated she was supposed to have left parliament already, she refuses to leave. All right, simple, simple, straightforward. It is blown up in the media. Everybody has had what they had to say. And then you have this group of people, and this is the question to you. They have this group of people that are sitting there and saying, ha, this is why we should never vote for third parties. <laughs> No, <laughs> I, la I laugh the same way. <laughs> I'll tell you my first response, but you keep voting for PVP and PNC. I don't get it, <laughs> right? So clearly trust is not high up on your agenda, right? <laughs> so nonetheless, I want you to please help me um, address this idea that people cannot trust third parties because of that historical... Um, 
you know, a little, little spiel I gave you there on what has been painted as don't trust third parties, more or less by the PPP, because APN UAFC has happily, you know, joined forces with third forces. But again, we've seen how much of a waste they are. Nonetheless, I'd like you to tell me why people should still believe and trust in the third party uh, concept. Well, I don't think that you should automatically trust in any party. Good. Um, trust is earned. Mm -hmm. No. You started the history relatively recently with the AFC, but it went back to the United Force. It went back long ago to Peter DeGar's party joining up with Barnum and being subsumed. Um, the AFC were the most successful third party because they managed to get that swing vote. They did absolutely nothing with it. Um, they betrayed the trust of the people when they failed to draw a line in the sand against the excesses of the up new party when in government. Mm -hmm. And they lost the support of everybody who had been voting for AFC. So I don't have confidence in AFC. And I don't <laughs> think the rest of the country has confidence in AFC. <laughs> Again, agree. this is common sense. Mm -hmm. So Schumann did his thing, Liberty and Justice Party. He, has, he is perceived as having been subsumed into the PPP. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I would like to say this about Schumann. He made a promise and he kept his word. Mm -hmm. And um, whether you want to talk about individuals or parties or big parties or little parties, if you shake somebody's hand and you make your make a promise and you give your word, I expect you to keep your word. And Schumann did that. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's the end of the conversation about Schumann, because that puts him head and shoulders above most of the other politicians that I've come across in this country. <laughs> Fair. And that's the end of that. Mm -hmm. um, whether he made bad decisions in terms of business, in terms of the arrangements with the PPP in terms of his personal Different affairs has nothing to do with me. The man yeah. kept his word. That's mm -hmm. the end of that. How on earth do you take an example like Dr. Asha Kisun, who did not keep her word, and translate that into some imagined genre, some imagined category called third parties or called small parties, mm -hmm. and then attribute a specific characteristic to this entire imagined genre of third party <laughs> and okay. say, can't trust them, but you trust the big parties. <laughs> Fair. That is the most ridiculous <laughs> thing I've heard in a long time. And I, yeah. I do hear people say it. Mm -hmm. So you got to look at who is saying it. And it's the same people who say, we had big hopes for AFC and they let us down. Let me tell you, these are people who never voted for a third party. These are people who are clinging at a straw. They're <clears throat> clutching at a straw to find some kind of moral or ethical justification for voting the way they have always voted and their families have always voted and their grandfathers and grandmothers have always voted <laughs> along ethnic lines. And they are clinging to any, anything to rationalize it, to vindicate it, to justify it. When at the end of the day, they never voted for a third party. They never planned to vote for a third party. They're voting along ethnic alliances and they will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. That is not the kind of person I am speaking to. Mm -hmm. I am speaking to the people who, despite the fact that they felt aggrieved and betrayed when AFC announced its running with APNU in the 2015 elections, nevertheless held strong and decided we are sticking with AFC in the hope that they will draw the line in the sand and avoid the excesses. Now, I don't agree with you about the first couple years of APNU. The first couple years of APNU, as far as I'm concerned, I immediately saw a heavy-handed and vindictive nature directed against the community that was perceived to have the money was perceived to have been corrupt. I, you will remember there were businessmen who were stopped at the airport and couldn't leave the country. There were people who were arrested. There was an... A, if you go into Kingston, there are people living in Kingston who were approached by young men in short jacks saying, this house doesn't belong to you. This is government house. Mm -hmm. And this happened immediately after the 2015 elections. People who had been living quite happily for... Yeah, 30 years. There was this wild and stupid rush. Witch, witch hunt. Yeah. To make a, yes, mm -hmm. to try to find mm -hmm. people who had done harm. 
mm-hmm. without any kind of system and without any kind of proportionality. Right. And that heavy handedness immediately alienated the entire Indo Guyanese community and it killed the chance that APNU had to come back, no matter mm-hmm. what good a job they did. And, and AFC then, being voiceless in this whole and scenario. And AFC did nothing about it. Mm-hmm. You saw the removal of everybody from any position of employment in Guyana. So all the commissions, all the boards, all the structures, there was a complete change of staff, whether or not the people who were there before were qualified and competent, or whether they were political appointees, a complete change of personnel. And it happened again in 2020. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, it vindicates the point of view of the ethnic voter, the voter who is voting against a race-based party. It vindicates his point of view that he has to do what he's doing because that party there has it in for him. He has to defend himself. And every time we had a change of government, we have seen the vindication of that point of view. Yeah. And that is why. But we were were watching it right now again, though. But that is why. When people say you can't trust the third party, mm-hmm. let me tell you, the third party doesn't come because they're going to get a reward. Mm-hmm. It's hard work. I don't have to tell you, you've been trying. Mm-hmm. It's thankless. 98% of the population hate what you're doing because mm-hmm. you're not supporting their side. And, and the, other 10, go, the other 2% don't trust you. And yeah. the <laughs> other 2%, you, unlike APNU, which come hell or high water, 45 to 50 percent of the population will vote for them because of that ethnic alliance. Yeah. Unlike PPP, come hell or high water, 45 or 50 will vote for them. The people who voted for AFC did not do so because they had to. Mm-hmm. They did so because they felt that trust had been earned. And as soon as that trust was lost, yeah. they went. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. let me tell you, Barnum destroyed our economy. And White only had a few years to recover. I think he's our best president, but he compromised himself by sitting quiet during Burnham's excesses of rigged elections and destruction. And in 1992, it was a close, close vote. Mm-hmm. The PNC supporters did not care okay. about all of that. Between 92 and 2015, the PPP demonstrated a lack of vision, a lack of creativity, all they did at first was continue White's economic recovery plan. They became increasingly corrupt. Mm-hmm. And in 2015, at a time when they had been corrupt for nearly 30 years, they lost by one seat. Mm-hmm. Their supporters did not care <laughs> if they're corrupt and if their economic um, policies were unimaginative and if we'd been doing the same thing and remain second force in the hemisphere to Haiti. They didn't care. Mm-hmm. they have votes that they own that they will never lose the AFC did not have that luxury Agreed. and no third party has that luxury the third party has to it's demonstrate mm-hmm. that it will earn the loyalty of its voters by good policies by good suggestions and hopefully that is what can happen because okay. without that all right stop. I've been, I love it. I, you know what? And I'm going to put you on quite the hot seat right now. You're not going to like what I'm about to ask you, but you're going to answer anyway. <laughs> so um, I'll tell you, I, I'm going to say this very openly so everybody understands. I am the chairman of ANUG and Timothy Jonas is the um, general secretary of ANUG. In no way, shape or form is this conversation a, um, um, uh, ANUG um, approved, if you will. It has, um, we're about to have a very frank conversation of, of I, what I'd like from Timothy Jonas's opinion. All right, I'm asking him as an individual, not not as a uh, as, as an ANUG executive. So, one of the things that I know people have been looking for over the past um, couple of years are um, are some policies that they would like. Um, represented in Parliament. Now, what I mean by that is we have reached a point in this country where I think a lot of individuals have realized that their needs and what they need to make their lives better are not being met. And what people look for from any politician, for that matter, is leadership. All right? Now, when it comes to leadership, at some point in time, you have to be able to stand up and say, this is a promise that I will make if I get into power. Now, whether they vote for PPP, 
PNC, ANUG, whoever they, they choose to vote, that's about the limit of the options. Um, unfortunately, we, we'll see as 2025 approaches. Um, at the moment, I, I want to ask you, if you as an individual citizen right now had to look to vote for somebody, we're looking for specific promises needed in society that will blanket, that will make everyone's lives better, including yourself. What do you need to hear from a politician? I don't mean, I don't, I don't, you don't need to make everybody's life perfect at the moment, but as a politician, I'd like you to tell me what you are hoping to see changed in this country. <laughs> I want to hear what you, I, I can start this off. I'm going to make that life really simple, like silly, sorry, silly easy. Okay. I need to see duties on vehicles lower okay i i'll give you my rationale the 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 2024 budget the 1.1 trillion dollars only eight percent of that budget came from personal income tax because sorry, sorry came from personal taxation all right meaning um there was there was personal income tax uh uh, duties, etc., on personal items, etc., and then I think one more category. But nonetheless, the personal taxes that people paid only came, uh, amounted to eight percent of that budget. Now, my question is: if they're only using eight percent of our taxpayers' money to make one point one trillion dollars, eight percent being such a marginal number, then why are we still paying such high duties on on things like vehicles? We all think, we all know it's ridiculous. And I would like to stand up here, and it's something I'm going to be proposing, hopefully eventually to, to, to whoever listens to me, um, that at some point we have to we have to bring down taxes on things on items like, like vehicles duties have to come down why do we need to pay a hundred percent on a four-door pickup or, or a van or something that we our money can earn we could see it online we could afford it but we can't buy it because the duties to bring it into this country are ridiculous now I can easily see if it's only eight twenty eight percent. I can easily see bringing those taxes down to twenty percent and it having no effect on our economy whatsoever. Because the let's be honest, most of the vehicles that are brought in, the big fancy Prados and these four door pickups, all of us know that they ain't paying duties on those anyway. Majority of them are not paying duties on them, right? The government brings it in, or some friend with with a duty free that they give out and they hand out to the people, right? Or or luckily some business gets through with it, or some mining company. But nonetheless. I believe that those taxes could be brought down, and I believe that there's definitely a way to bring those duties down to, to 20%, especially if it's only 8%. Now, something similar to this. What do you see that you might have no reason to, 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 to question can be changed if this government chose to change it? That wouldn't affect our budget, wouldn't affect you know, the economy, wouldn't affect... Uh, the, the, the law and, and, and human rights of this country. What do you, it, it, on a personal level, what do you think needs changing? All right. Now, I want to say to the viewers that <clears throat> Kian does not warn me about these questions. I come here and I sit down. We haven't had a conversation for days. And um, he throws these things at me. And mm -hmm. sometimes he throws a googly. And I got to work on it. So let me answer the question in a way that it might be a bit long-winded, and, and full disclosure, Kian has accused me of being long-winded. He says lawyers talk too much and all of that. <laughs> but there's no short answer to that question. I agree. So I want to talk to you, first of all, about that example, um, duty on vehicles. Here's the statistics. Here's the truth. I happen to know this because I've asked various um, auditors and accountants and people in the ministry that is responsible. The threshold for the vehicles that makes it impossible to import is over 2,000 cc's. Now, the middle class folk that are listening know what I'm talking about. Your X-Trail, 2,000 cc's. Your CRV, 2,000 cc's. That is the most, that's the best you can do. And you pay about 2 million, 2.5 million duty for that. And it hurts. As soon as you go over 2,000 cc's, so you start looking at land cruisers and, and that kind of thing, the duty goes up so exponentially you cannot pay for it. And you ask yourself, why is this? Let me give you a statistic. First of all, the, the, the duty is so much, it's like four or five times the cost of the vehicle itself. Correct. Right? So it's an, it's an impossibility. Why would you, why would a country charge you in respect of a vehicle that you pay 20,000 US for, charge you 8,000 duty to get into the country. Obviously, you can't get it into the country. Why? Statistically, in Guyana, 
out of 100 Prado Land Cruisers that you see on that road, less than one has duty paid on it. What do you mean, less than one? I'll say it again. Please. Out of 100 Prados that you see on that road in Guyana, less than one, statistically speaking, less than 1% is duty paid. All of them are duty free. I want you to think about that statistic. If the purpose of tax is to bring revenue into the country, all those Prados equate to zero revenue, zero duty. I mean, you pay other small things, you pay VAT and that kind of story, fine. But we're talking about the tax that hurts, the tax that renders that vehicle inaccessible to you, your average Guyanese. That tax isn't paid on any of those vehicles that you're looking at. What that means is that the country is not earning any revenue. So the purpose of tax, which is to bring in revenue, is defeated. No revenue for those. The country has not earned revenue for those. So what on earth is the purpose of assessing that kind of tax for that kind of vehicle? In my mind, the only possible purpose can be to make you second-class citizens. There's no other reason. The self-important, puffed up, arrogant folk that like to run this country and strut around the place want to be first class citizens and they want to drive down the road in their vehicles that are distinguishable from your vehicle. And we have heard the members of the police force say, you know from the type of vehicle what vehicle you should stop on the road and what vehicle you should not stop on the road. They don't get stopped. You know vehicle to stop for tint. They don't get stopped for tint. I challenge you to look at police on the road and see if they ever stop a Land Cruiser. Or ever strip a Prado's tint off. <laughs> so Agreed. no duty, no benefit to the country from this exorbitant, ridiculous, impossible tax. And yet the <clears> vehicles are coming in to make you a second class citizen and the people that are driving those vehicles, the government, the parliamentarians, their friends, their family, first class citizens. And here's the thing. Tax is imposed as a law, and I have a view that if you're a lawmaker, if you're a person who passes the law, if you're sitting there in parliament, you should never be exempt from any law you pass, because that is a recipe for unfair laws. If I can make a law saying you must pay $10 and I only pay $1, if I can do that, I am in a position to make unfair laws, and that must not be allowed. It is my view that no member of parliament, nor their family, should ever get a tax exemption that is not available to every Guyanese citizen. And if you made that mandatory, you would be amazed how quickly tax laws would suddenly be fair. <laughs> suddenly, you would be equal to those self-important people driving around the place. So to answer you, Good. I don't agree mm -hmm. that they shouldn't be taxed. Agreed. But the tax must be fair and it must apply to the people who impose the tax on you as well as to the people who the tax is imposed on. Now for me, there's a simple and common sense approach to vehicle, vehicles and taxation. We got too many vehicles on the road. Mm -hmm. We got people who got more money than they know what to do with. Got five, six, seven vehicles parked up in the driveway. You got traffic congestion in town. For me, I would reduce duty on vehicles, yes. 10%, and I'll give you a reason why later. But what I would also do is I would increase the cost of the yearly road license that you pay. Mm -hmm. So right now we're paying three, 4,000 a year. Mm -hmm. I would make the 50,000, 70,000, depending on the kind of vehicle. 7,000 a month, can't quarrel, is less than a tank of gas. But what it would mean is that in a five year period, the government, and the state would earn the revenue that it has lost, that it is losing on the importation. So you reduce the cost to import, but you make sure you make up for it in the five or seven years, the life of the vehicle. So there's a yearly amount that has to be paid. So you recover it. What it also will mean is that there's no people driving, keeping three and four and five vehicles 
because if they got to pay $100,000 a year for each of those vehicles or $70,000 for each of those vehicles, suddenly that's a problem. Mm -hmm. It would also mean that there's an ongoing revenue stream to help the construction of roads, to help more roads, more arteries in and out of town so that we have, we don't have the kind of congestion we have and we have an independent source of revenue from the vehicles that is continuous. It also will mean that when your vehicle get old, you want to get rid of it because you simply can't afford to have an old vehicle that you're paying all of this money every year for. I, what I what I what I'd like to argue, not argue, not argue. I, I agree with you. I, I like the idea because at the end of the day, guys, what we're doing here is looking for for alternative economic solutions. Okay, that's all we talk about. I can tell you as a as a political organization, that's all that you try to find solutions for. It's it's not just about bringing things down and minusing and and etc. There are things that you have to accommodate for. Now, what I can, you see, what, uh, you guys, I guess, can be privy to a conversation like this. What I, what I can suggest is if a vehicle is registered under somebody's name, one vehicle can be registered and pay, you know, twenty thousand um, dollars a year road tax, and every vehicle that's under their name thereafter, they should pay more tax on. You understand? Obviously, business will be left out and, and handled separately, corporate, etc., because that's, um, you know, for businesses, but. Personal vehicles, as you said, if there's an issue which I think all of us can agree with, that there's way too many vehicles on the road as we speak, right? No matter, at the end of the day, I, I, I like to pay close attention to that no matter how much roads they're building, the traffic is still ridiculous, right? Because the roads are coming in, the, sorry, the cars are coming in as fast as the roads are being built. But it's managed in other countries, and I think that's, right. a, that's something we have to examine. Why isn't right. it managed in this country? Yeah. And there's a reason for that. Uh -huh. um, I'll use Georgetown as an example, although no, Amsterdam um, has the same issue. The fact is that if you look at urban growth in other countries, it's managed so that communities are self-sufficient. So when a community pops up, mm -hmm. so Grove, um, Diamond, or Stellan, Diamond, mm -hmm. it should be self-sufficient. You should have your shops, you should have your schools, you should have your hospitals, absolutely. you should have, and if there are good schools there and if it is self-sufficient there yeah i like it the rush that we see in guyana where every single citizen tries to get to georgetown where the schools are where the shopping is where the health is where the ministries are that will go away mm -hmm. how urban growth is managed elsewhere is to create those areas as little cells cells that are self-sufficient economically and as a social environment you put your cricket ground and your swimming pool and your clubhouse right there mm -hmm. so that a child children, from diamond and i'll go to qc in a town. child from diamond mm -hmm. will walk to school in diamond mm -hmm. after school will go to the club in diamond yep. they'll be able to swim at the pool in diamond yeah that's how it works mm -hmm. in this country we don't like to do that we like centralization of power and the centralization of power means we got one national swimming pool how embarrassing is that? So you ask me what I would do, and we, we talk about the vehicles, that's fine. For me, the solution to Guyana is to decentralize power and money and control of the finances from the government, to decentralize it to the NDCs and to the RDCs so that communities look to the RDC and the NDC and they are financially self-sufficient and can do their own stuff. Mm -hmm. If you do that, if you reduce the role of central government so that they're not hustling to go building roads in south, hoping to get Afro votes that they will never get, right? they can do their job, which is to run the country, to implement systems that have broken down for revenue collection. And the RDCs and the NDCs with financial autonomy can deal with the villages that they have control of. Empower local government. And mm -hmm. the way to do that is to reinstitute a fair system of payment of rates. Now, if you live in a house in Region 4, you know, you might not like what I'm telling you, but you know that if you live in a house that's worth 25, 30, 40 million dollars, you only pay in eight or ten or twelve thousand dollars a year rates and taxes you should be paying more if there's a fair system of rates and taxes so that in grove in lbi in horstel in, in diamond the buildings that are there that we see are paying fair rates and taxes to their ndc's 
those NDCs will have the wherewithal mm -hmm. to make those places so transformatively beautiful. Drains, pavements and sidewalks, roads that are perfect, clearing up the trash, keeping the parapet but I, pristine, I want, they right. will be able to afford it. And the, we won't have to wait for the government to come in to save the day when there are these huge potholes because the NDC and the RDC is bankrupt. But hold on, I, I want to touch on a very important fact here because I don't think everybody's fully understanding the end result of what you're saying. If you have a situation where the local government, your NDC, your RDC can take care of your community and the money that you're paying goes to them and they develop it and beautify it, take care of the roads, take care of the gutters. What people don't realize is that also is going to raise your property value. So all of a sudden, although you feel like you're paying more, you are earning more because it's a more developed area. All of a sudden, somebody wants to come and live in your community because everything is being taken care of properly. Well, I think more than that. Huh? Mm -hmm. People look, um, I don't think anyone will look at it simplistically to say, wait, you want me to pay more rates and taxes? Let me, let me point this out from my own experience, and I'll ask Guyanese if I'm not speaking the truth. If you pay 30000 a year rates and taxes on your house, you got to pay about 5000 a month for the garbage collection. You got to pay another 5000 6000 a fortnight to weed the parapet and keep the drain clean. If we had NDCs that work, and between that 5000 and that 6000 you're talking $120,000 a year already, in addition to the 30 or 40000 that you're paying for rates and taxes. <laughs> we pay more money for the services that the NDCs and the RDC should be providing as part of their complement of services. We pay more money for those things than we pay the NDC and the RDC. And the fact is that if the NDC was equipped and financially autonomous, they could deal with garbage collection, with maintenance of drains, maintenance of roads, maintenance of parapets, far more cheaply than each individual does now having to pay and manage their own garbage disposal and their own drain maintenance and parapet mm -hmm. maintenance. The system has to be allowed to work. And you got to ask yourself, why doesn't the system work? The reason the system doesn't work is because the government hasn't allowed valuations of properties to be done since 1996 so that they are deliberately starving the city councils, the town councils, and the NDCs. They are starving them so that they remain financially dependent on the government. And the government remains the only entity, because it's the only tax collecting entity, that has the wherewithal to say, I'll come in and build a road for you. I'll come in and maintain a drain for you. Vote for me. That needs to stop. There needs to be a decentralization away so that the various institutions are financially autonomous and can do what they're supposed to do. And it will mean the government's role is then more narrow and hopefully they could start to do their job properly too. Mm -hmm. I, I hear you. Um, I, I, here, let me ask a very important question just um, to really grasp the entire situation. Can this be done through parliament or do, in the context of uh, a simple majority or is this a constitutional change? Uh, that's interesting. Now, when I started, when I lost confidence with AFC and I decided AFC had been subsumed into APNU and we were really lost if we were back to the two-party race, um, I thought that constitutional reform was the way to go. And constitutional reform has become a cliche. You hear it so much, it's lost meaning. It's, it's, it's said and said and said and said. And it's impossible. The reason it's impossible is that neither the two big parties want it. And if you want constitutional reform, you need two-thirds vote in parliament. So APNU and PPP will have to agree. And they can't even agree on a chancellor. Good. So you're not going to have constitutional reform. Let me be frank about that. I am on the Constitution Committee, the Constitution Reform Committee. It hasn't met yet. Don't expect it to meet for just now. When it meets, it will be stymied, it will be frustrated, it will be obstructed by the two large parties. And the obstruction will be done in ways that will frustrate everybody and lead to nothing. I'll tell you that frankly, no. But there is a lot that can be done with just the opposition majority in Parliament. I'll give you the history of why Georgetown is no longer a garden city. And the history of Georgetown being no longer a garden city applies to all the NDCs, RDCs, Amsterdam, Linden, and all the rest of them. 
it goes back to the PNC days of the 80s. Now, the system works well. The system of rates and taxes is fair. Because if you got a big house, it means you're rich. And therefore, you should pay more tax, more rates, than the man who got a small house. And he should pay more rates than the man or woman who has no house and is renting. So rates are assessed against the owner of immovable property. If you got immovable property, if you got a house, you must pay rates. And if your house is big, you must pay more. And if you got a skyscraper, you must pay more than everybody. It's fair. Here's the thing. Under the system, back in the day, when you didn't pay your rates, the city call had a clear and easy way to seize your house and sell it for the payment of rates. So you don't pay your rates, they send you a notice. You don't pay your rates after you get the notice, they take your house, they sell it. And somebody else owns your house. It sounds harsh, but rates are half of a percent of the value of your house. So it's not a large amount to pay every year. And for those rates, you get your drains cleaned, you get your street maintained, you get your parapets cleaned, you get crime fighting, you get police monitoring traffic, city police monitoring traffic, you get all of the services that you expect in Georgetown and you get it done properly if the city hall has enough money to do it. Right now, as you see, you get none of those things. The roads are bad, the municipal police are virtually useless, non-existent, the garbage is intermittently collected and they got all kinds of problems with garbage and, and contracts with the garbage collectors. Your drains are not well kept and are clogged. And if you get the slightest rain, the city floods. How can Guyanese be satisfied with this? The reason that it became hard for the city to sell these properties is that under the, APNU, under, under the PNC, this was before APNU, it was decided that these people who are making a business of going to buy property when it's sold because you don't pay the rates, these people making too much of a profit. So laws were passed to make it very difficult for the city to sell the properties at what they call parade execution. A simple majority in parliament can remove those laws to make it easy for those sales to take place. Suddenly you won't see derelict buildings anymore. You won't see rubbish mm -hmm. on the roads. You won't see any of those things. A simple minority government with a majority in opposition can pass the laws to get those things done. The next thing that that opposition in parliament can do just with the swing vote, they can mandate that the chief valuation officer whose job it is to value those properties does his job to value the properties for the purpose of calculating those rates, which is a percentage of the value of the property. We have a situation where those skyscrapers that you see going up, those people are paying $30,000 a year rates. That should never be allowed. And the truth is that if the owners of those skyscrapers started paying real value as rates, because rates is fair, if you're rich, you pay more. If they had to pay the real value as a percentage of the real value of their property, the smaller folk would have to pay less. And it would be fair. So the change in this system would not lead to a greater imposition on your average person, but it would lead to better police um, assistance in the city, better traffic control. People talk about the vendors selling on Regent Street. They set up the stall, they block your access to the shops, they block you walking up and down, they park on the road so that and, and sell out to the back of the car so the traffic is blocked. And there's a big to do about whether they should be allowed to sell or whether you're, you're um, doing a wrong thing when you stop this happening. Let me make this point to you. When you have a shop in Regent Street, if that shop pays fair rates and taxes so that that shop is contributing to the revenue that you need to clean your drain, maintain your road, all of those things, clear the garbage. And you can't allow customers into that shop because somebody has set up on the pavement outside and that person is not paying rates. That person is not contributing 
in a way that allows the city to provide the services. In fact, that person is impeding the pavement, littering, because after they're done, look and see. The little the, the wood stands are there, the rubbish that they leave behind is there. That person's vehicle is parked, blocking traffic <clears throat> to sell goods out of the back of the vehicle. That would stop. The city hall would be able to pay for the parapets to be maintained. They would be able to pay to sort out drainage so that there's better drainage in the wards and we would not have flooding every time it rains. A lot needs to be done <clears throat> and there's a system and a way to get it done and it doesn't need constitutional reform. Well, <laughs> first of all, I did say that he is long-winded. <laughs> but, but more importantly, I just would like, it's very important to understand, please, for our viewers out there, that these are the types of conversations that we do have within our ANUG. All right, and it's very important, one, to understand um, to understand why things are happening. And I mean, when you have a mind like uh, Timothy Joe, our senior counsel over here, that understands the inner workings, we can definitely get a better idea of how we can look at implementing changes. All right, the first, th the first thing everybody has to understand, and again, it, it's probably the critical part that nobody gets in Guyana right now because they're not supposed to, because both the PNC and PPP keep it from them. They don't understand the system properly. They don't understand why things are happening. And much more importantly, they can't point out the flaws. And that's what these two big governments are trying to ensure that nobody can do. So when you sit down here and you listen to this, oh, geez, it, you know, maybe this doesn't affect you at all. It's a really an understanding of the system, which is important for us to help to make better decisions. All right. So we're not just implementing Wild West. We're not just coming with wild promises. We have to ensure that we understand what the best route forward is in creating a solution. So when we say, OK, maybe we should pay a little bit more pay a little bit more here but reduce here so for example pay a little bit more duty pay a little less duties uh, sorry a lot less duties on vehicles but pay a little bit more in licenses it's to understand that there has to be creating a balance not just to ensure that people's um pockets are 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 not hit as hard but even more so to ensure that their quality of life does not drop but more so increase so there has to be a give and take. There has to be a balance. It's not just a wild decision of, oh, I'm just going to come out and say, let's drop duties on vehicles and that's it, folks. Okay, and we walk away. No, we have to understand that if you are trying to create a system with less corruption you and you, and you want to also lower taxes and duties on certain things, then there has to be a makeup for money that is going to come in in other places. And But again, as Tim explained with the houses and the duties, you have to understand that there are those that can afford it, that can pay, and that can keep the burden on everyone else lower. But All you're right. right. It, it, one does tie into the other and everything is yeah. interconnected. But mm -hmm. let me make this point as well um, to follow up on what you're saying. If you empower the RDCs and the NDCs by fair allocation of rates throughout mm -hmm. all of those places so that they are building their own roads and maintaining their own drains, you take away from the central government the right, the power, the ability to go and spend money that it gets from taxation, building roads and fixing drains in areas that the NDC should be dealing with. Yeah. What that means is that the expenditure by central government goes down. Mm -hmm. And for every road that they don't have to build mm -hmm. in some village, to say to those villages, come vote for me, mm -hmm. because the NDC is looking after it, the RDC is looking after it. In every drain that they don't have to spend money, every contract that they don't have to give to family and friends in all of those areas, there is more revenue retained mm -hmm. that they could give our teachers more money. Right, there you go. That they could pay our public servants better. There you go, the nurses, the doctors, our teachers and absolutely. Nurses so by decentralizing the financial autonomy to the agencies that should be dealing with it, Mm -hmm. You constrict the government's role to a more narrow focus and the government has the same revenue, is the same taxes they get in from the corporations, from oil, from all of that. Mm -hmm. But now it's being spent in a more narrow area and that ties in to allow the government to unfortunately spend money where there are no kickbacks. So to increase, increase salaries, <laughs> right. which is exactly what needs to be done now. So it's all interconnected and it all works. 
Um, you know, guys, on that note, we are coming to a close, but I'm happy you guys get, uh, you know, I felt like this show was a little bit more insight on what our conversations are like um, within ANUG. So I'm happy you guys are, um, you know, we're privy to this type of conversation. And I hope, you know, you guys can contribute uh, in any way, shape or form um, to to obviously figuring out, as, as I like to say, alternative economic solutions. Because if there's one thing we can argue is that if we keep doing the same thing over and over like we have been, we are not going to get anywhere as we are watching happen all right as tim said in our last show something is wrong and we have to fix it all right guys so on that note i'd like you all to i'd like to thank you all for joining us i'd like to thank tim for for coming in and here. educating us once again uh, me with two questions but... yeah yeah i know he was long-winded but uh, <laughs> nonetheless as you guys can tell i do appreciate it most of the time because i learned something all right so on that note guys um be safe out there uh I, I'm going to say this over and over. It is a absolutely epidemic on what's going on in the roads in this country right now. It's it's honestly, if we were to somebody, we, we have to put these statistics together. I can't believe, you know, we all sit here and don't feel it until it happens to us. But there are way too many people dying on the roads. OK, and it's not stopping. It's just increasing. All right. And I will always be the first to say, you know, it, it stems from a lawless society. I, I, I'm, I'm, it stresses me out. You know, just uh, we'll talk about it on another show. But, you know, if everyone in this country feels that they can drive as fast as they want, they can drink and drive, they can run traffic lights. This is how we're going to end up. Perhaps we can do a we, program on that. We can definitely do it. All right. On that note, guys, thank you for joining us. Please be safe out there. And we'll see you here next Friday on A Politically Incorrect. Take care. <laughs>